Okay, so um, thank you so much for logging in. Uh, my name is Dr. Elia Kamineski. Um, I run Myos Decare down in the Financial District of New York City. Um, thank you so much for attending the Myos Decare lecture series. Uh, today we have a very special speaker, Dr. Avital Falk. But before we get started, I just wanted to thank Select Office Suites who sponsors these events. Um, that's where I have my practice, um, down in the financial district, and they got all this wine and cheese for us, so thank you very much, and the conference room. So cool. So I'm just going to introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Avital Falk, who will be on the camera in a minute, um, is the director of the Well Cornell Pediatric OCD Anxiety and Tick Disorder Program, POCAT an expert in evidence-based interventions for children and adolescents suffering from OCD, anxiety, and mood disorders. She's an expert in evidence-based interventions for children and adolescents specializing in CBT and exposure response prevention, and provides a variety of clinical services, including a diagnostic assessment therapy and consultations. Uh, so without further ado, um, Dr. Falk is gonna discuss intensive treatment for pediatric OCD. All right, does that work for sound? Oh, it's okay, got it. Let's just put this up. All right, so I hope people can see the slides. If not, then you can download them later. <laughs> so um, I will try to make sure that I explain everything pretty clearly. But um, thank you so much for having me today. And I'm excited to talk about intensive treatment for OCD and anxiety, um, an area that I'm quite passionate about. And so what I'm going to do is go through OCD and the current treatments that we have for OCD, and then talk about, oops, I'm losing the mic, um, talk about why, will that work? All right. Why we intensify treatment, um, the history and research support that we have supporting intensive treatment for OCD. I'll talk a little bit about our program at Wild Cornell, which is an example of what an intensive treatment can look like, and then finally discuss beyond, expanding beyond just outpatient intensive care into acute care programs, which there is a real need for more acute care programs for OCD in this country. So what is OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder? So obsessions are thoughts, images, urges, feelings that come in over and over and over again. Um, these look different for each person. And sorry to pause for one second. I think the video might not be capturing. Did it change? I don't, I just heard a ding and then it switched. Okay. Uh, so we are experiencing technical. I'm difficulty. happy to speak without my picture on there. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> so that I can see all of you. Certainly. It's whichever you guys want, so. Okay, so you're there. Oh, it's back up. It's back up, okay, so. All right. Maybe right there. There we go, Let's go back to this. There we go, sorry about that. All right, so we're saying, Obsessions are the thoughts, images, urges, or feelings that come in over and over and over again. And these look different for each person. What is kind of true across the board is that it's what a person is truly horrified by um, and what is difficult for that person. Sometimes the obsession is simply, I won't be able to handle it. It might not be a specific feared outcome. The compulsions are the behaviors that a person engages in to quiet or alleviate that distress that comes from the obsessions. These are not always obvious. Sometimes there's mental compulsions, sometimes there's sneaky compulsions that you might be able, not be able to naturally pick up on. And sometimes there's avoidance of things that might be difficult for the person to do. So for example, I had a patient who would ask her mother to just pick things up for her, but that was all in an attempt to avoid having to do some evening out compulsions. What makes it a disorder? So many, many, many people have compulsive behaviors and even more have obsessive thoughts. So what makes it a disorder? That it's messing up our lives in some way. The epidemiology of OCD 
So there's about, there are two peaks of when OCD kind of comes on board in pre-adolescent children and then in early adults. And really pretty much across the lifespan, the prevalence rates are about one to 2%. So how do we treat OCD? So the POT study or the pediatric OCD treatment studies were really the center of um, thinking about how we treat OCD. And we know that the gold standard treatment is a combination between CBT um, with an, a focus on exposure and response prevention plus an SSRI like Zoloft. And CBT alone, as well as um, an SSRI alone do work, but the best treatment that we have is a combination between the two. We have excellent manuals to treat OCD. So for those of you who can see the slides, I just have a picture of all the different treatments that work manuals for, or not necessarily all, but many of them that treat OCD. And this means that they already have a lot of evidence behind them. So these treatments are very, very good and treat a large number of people. So what is the problem with them? And the answer is that most of these programs are about 14 sessions across 12 to 14 weeks. And they might not be able to reach everybody who might need a slightly different level of care. So this picture, if you can see it, it's a picture of a toilet in a really dirty bathroom. And it's from an Atlantic article that was published in 2016, where the headline is, the only cure for OCD is expensive, elusive, and scary. And unfortunately, a lot of people are well familiar with this problem, that the average length of time until somebody finds good treatment for OCD can be years and years and years, sometimes in the teens. And that's a really big problem in our country that people are not able to find the, the treatment that they need. So even though we have these excellent treatments, there's a problem of access to care, both in terms of the costliness of the treatment, as well as trained providers who can do it. So what is the treatment? Most of these treatments are cognitive behavioral therapy with a focus on exposure and response prevention. And I'll talk a little bit more about the exposure and response prevention piece in just a few minutes. So how does it work? Some fear or obsession pops in. And for those of you who can see my graph, it shows that there's a line that goes right up. So when that obsession pops in, your anxiety or discomfort will spike. And at the top of that spike, you have what I really deliberately call a decision point. You get to decide what to do. Are you going to give in and do a compulsion or are you going to resist and avoid the compulsion and face the situation? If you do give in at that top of the peak, at that decision point, your anxiety will come right down and you'll feel this magical feeling called relief. And relief is so reinforcing. It teaches our brain, hey, whatever you did to just get this relief, you should do that again and again and again. So what's the alternative? At that decision point, if you choose to face it, you will, one of two things will happen. Either that anxiety will probably rise a little bit, but then eventually slowly but surely, maybe with some bumps in the road, come down. Or it may not come down. We know as more recent research that we don't always habituate, we don't always get used to it, but you may learn that to get better and better at tolerating the distress and tolerating the anxiety. And with practice, it gets easier, either because the distress is coming down or because you're getting stronger and better able to tolerate that distress. So again, why can't we just use what we have? So there's a couple problems with this. One of them is that we know that weekly CBT doesn't help everybody. So I'm just gonna move back a little bit. Here, there we go, all right. So we know that weekly CBT doesn't help everybody. Some people need help and they need help quickly. And there's a number of reasons for this. Um, so before I jump into all the reasons why I think intensive treatment for OCD is actually wonderful and super beneficial, I do wanna talk a little bit into, about some of the research behind it. And one of the most impressive studies comes out of the mental health system or the healthcare system more broadly in Norway. So in Norway, it's a little bit different from us and they have public health care. So everybody who has OCD is entitled to treatment for it. And they had very long wait lists. So while they had great care, people were waiting a very long time to get to it. So they thought about how can we clear these wait lists and intensive treatment does have support. So the idea was what if we took everybody and slotted them into four days of treatment where we're gonna treat them all day, every day for four days. And the amazing thing is that these people got better in just four days. And this article from Scientific American, if you can see the slides, it just shows an article that came out this past year. It shows that these gains were maintained. So it didn't just help after those four days were over, but when they did follow-up studies, they found that people continued to benefit from the treatment that they got over just four days. 
And if we can do that, it makes us think about how can we help people who are in great need of treatment and great need of treatment quickly. So the first mention of intensive treatment in the literature was in about 1984. It wasn't kind of talking about intensifying treatment, but it was describing treatment protocols that were happening three times a week for about 90 minutes each, which is much more than what most often we're doing when we do weekly therapy. In 1998, there were the first trials that said, hey, intensive treatment works. Pre and post data show that people are getting better when they do treatment in a shorter format. In 2003, there was the first randomized controlled trial for OCD, intensive treatment versus weekly treatment. And it showed that, hey, exactly what we predicted from the pre and post studies is true. And people do just as well in intensive treatment as they do when they do it weekly. And what we mean by intensive treatment, just to clarify for anybody who's listening, it's not necessarily doing more treatment. What it's doing is condensing treatment into a shorter period of time. So you might spend the same 10 hours, but instead of doing it across 10 weeks, you can do all 10 of those hours, possibly in one week, depending on the treatment protocol. In 2007, that study was repeated, but this time in a pediatric sample and the same results. People got just as much got better the same way they did in intensive treatment, just as they did in that weekly outpatient therapy. And finally, in 2015, a meta-analysis came out looking at all the studies of intensive treatment and similarly just showed the same results over and over that people do get better just as well with intensive treatment as they do with weekly outpatient therapy. And they actually found some possible immediate post-treatment benefits of intensive treatment. Do you want to ask a question? Yes. Um, do you know how long the, the long-term um, there's a few different follow-up points. I believe they have three months and six months, if I'm not mistaken. Do you know how you still conducting ongoing follow-up? They likely are. Um, I don't know the, near, the newest data, so I apologize. Um, so advantages of intensive treatment are that it works and it works quickly. And so I just mentioned a lot of the a review of the, um, excuse me, the randomized controlled trials. But we also have neurobiological evidence, which is very cool, that we can see in just four weeks neurobiological changes. And so that just goes to show that things are happening and they're happening quickly, even within the brain. And some of these pathways are exactly the same as we would have expected within weekly outpatient treatment. And some might be a slightly different pathway, but either way, we're seeing these changes and we're seeing them quickly. So just to go through some of the advantages of intensive treatment and who it might be right for. So, oops, losing my mic again. Intensive treatment is very good for complex cases, um, as well as partial or non-responders to medication. And if we even think about just qualitatively who our patients are and who might benefit from a course of, um, of intensive treatment, we think about the people who are out of school, who are out of work who might need to get their lives back on track quickly. They might not have three months or more to engage in treatment in order to get back on track. In fact, in those three months that they take off work, they might have loss of money. In three months that they take off school, they might miss a grade and have to start over or be transferred to a therapeutic boarding school, um, be put in a partial hospitalization program, an inpatient unit. So by giving, and they might also have collected impairment. So we've all seen the comorbidity that comes with OCD, but even more so, if a kid who has some symptoms of social anxiety is out of school for three months, it's gonna be incredibly difficult for them to get back into that setting. And so being able to give them that treatment and get them back to their functioning quickly is essential. There are also location advantages to doing intensive treatment. So I, I mentioned that article from The Atlantic, which was highlighting how difficult it is to find good OCD care. And so for people who don't live nearby, they may be able to travel either during a school break, during a holiday from work, and be able to come in and do intensive treatment quickly. And that's what we see a little bit in our program. So we do have people who are coming from the New York area, which is where we're based, but we also have people who are coming in from further away who can only spend a week or two with us and can get quite a bit done before they go back to their providers who are local, who might be able to continue this work, but might not be the first line treatment for OCD. In terms of cost considerations, there are pros and cons. So on the one hand, especially if you're paying privately, it can be a lot of money up front. But like I said, it's the same number of hours. So if you think about the cost as a whole, it can be quite helpful. Where it can be particularly helpful is for treatment resistant cases who might benefit from a large dose up front, and they may need fewer hours overall and may benefit from that. 
In terms of thinking about insurance companies, it can be really helpful in terms of preventing a partial hospitalization stay or an inpatient stay, which are much, much more costly than outpatient treatment. The flip side of that is a lot of insurance companies haven't yet caught up to the different types of treatment that we're doing, and they have limits on how many sessions you can have per week. So these are all things that kind of have to be worked out as we think about intensive treatments and get them to be used more broadly. Finally, and this is just a side point in terms of clinical focus, but intensive treatment studies are particularly useful as a research platform, or sorry, not intensive treatment studies, but intensive treatments. So when I've been reviewing the literature on intensive treatment, I found that certainly there are studies studying the effects of clinical care in an intensive treatment model, but there's also an enormous number of studies that use an intensive treatment as the base for studying something else. So for example, if you're looking in changes in cognition in treatment for OCD, Doing it in three weeks rather than waiting 14 weeks can be hugely advantageous when you're thinking about conducting a research study. So there's advantages outside of just the clinical care. So beyond kind of the research that we've talked about and these special populations that, we're, that it's good for, um, we're thinking about those qualitative benefits. And one more that I wanted to add is just that intensive treatment really combines the benefits of outpatient care with some of the benefits of an inpatient or more acute setting. So many of you, if you treat OCD, you might've had the experience of seeing a patient, you see them for 45 minutes, maybe an hour, and then you send them home with excellent exposure work. They might be doing, they might've done amazing exposures with you in your session. They faced all their fears. They touched all these things. They didn't wash their hands. They were doing such great work. And you send them home and you say, practice it every day for the next seven days until you see me again. And they come back seven days later, and they say to you, hey, that night when I went home, right after our session, I tried to do it at home and I ran into some trouble. So now they've gone a full week without practicing. Whereas if you're seeing them on a fairly regular basis, every day, every other day, you're able to nip those problems right away and get them back on track more quickly, which is one of the advantages that we have in acute care units. When we have someone in a partial program or in an inpatient unit, we're seeing them every day. We can troubleshoot, we can fix problems quickly, and we can get people back on track. Whereas we don't always have that opportunity within an outpatient setting. So this is just a graph that I love. Um, if, for those of you who can't see it, it just shows exponential growth. And what it's reflecting is the number of treatment studies on intensive treatments that have been coming out. So it starts in the 80s where there's pretty much none and goes all the way up to the current time when there are 15, 20 studies a year coming out. It just goes to show that this, oops, this area is certainly gaining popularity and a lot of attention. And I think we see a similar thing in terms of growth of intensive treatment programs across the country. So um, there still aren't enough, and I certainly will call all of you to think about how you can possibly incorporate intensive treatments into your own practices. However, um, the number of programs has grown, and every year more pop up, and more programs are, imp are implementing intensive treatments into their practices. So how do we actually do it? Um, so there's no one clear path to intensive treatment. And that's what's actually quite interesting about the literature, that there are a lot of the randomized controlled trials, of course, are based on a very clear study protocol. Many of them are developed by Lew Adam Lewin or Eric Storch and, um, and their groups. But, and so these involve a very specific way of doing things and they're described in the literature. However, when you look at many of the intensive treatment studies out there, they range anywhere from three hours a week to 15 hours a week. Um, they might be three days a week, they might be oh, three days a week across however many weeks, they might be 20 hours within one week. So there's a huge range in terms of the programs. Um, and that's, there's a huge range in terms of the studies out there. And what's the advantage of that is that it's not just these clear cut randomized control trials with very strict exclusion criteria that are describing that intensive treatment work. It's, it's across different samples, across different settings. Intensive treatment is working, whether you do it this way or that way, whether you do it in this setting or that setting, and people are getting better. And so I think that similar to anything else, that poses some advantages and disadvantages. I think it makes it a little less clear about how to do it, but it also, I think, can open the door that people can benefit from this treatment, even if there's no formal intensive treatment program in an area. Instead, they might be able to see their therapist multiple times a week doing this work and still gain some of the benefits of doing an intensive treatment program. 
So I just wanted to talk a little bit about my path to doing this to set up for talking about our program, which I'm just going to use as an example to illustrate what intensive treatment can look like. So I did my training out at UCLA and over there I trained at their program, which is in this was, I think it was called the Semmel, well, it was called the Semmel Institute at the time and they've changed that. But um, so there they have an excellent intensive outpatient program for OCD, both pediatric and adult. And that's where I really grew my passion for OCD treatment and specifically for intensive treatment because it was incredible to see how quickly people got better. What was shocking to me when I was working there was that people were coming from across the country to participate in this program. And people were coming from, it wasn't just areas where we have a lack of well-trained psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, mental health workers. It was from places like New York where you would think that people would have excellent access to care and people still were flying to LA to participate in an intensive treatment program, which got me asking why aren't there more treatment programs like this where people are getting better so quickly. And so I came to Wild Cornell to work with Shannon Bennett, who was one of the people who founded that treatment program at UCLA. And at Cornell, Shannon and I really talked about how do we create an intensive treatment program to serve the New York area and to just promote more and more of these programs. So our program, we have a child and adolescent program, which is our main focus, though we do see some young adults. So our child and adolescent program treats OCD, but it also treats other fear-based anxiety disorders. So as long as you can benefit from exposure, our program may be a good fit for you. We focus on cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure and response prevention, which we'll talk, we've talked about a little bit, but I'll talk about how that, what that actually looks like in practice. And our treatment strategies are applied flexibly. So like I said, there's a lot of different ways of doing this. In our treatment program, we see people anywhere from three hours a week to 10 hours a week. And people do that in different ways. So we offer up to three groups a week that, go, that are offered year round. And we also offer individual sessions to make sure we're incorporating the family component and individual therapy that certain patients may need. Our young adult program is more individually tailored. So we do have groups that go on at different times throughout the year, but it's not an ongoing three times a week program in the same way that our child and adolescent program is. And we still offer that same three to 10 hours a week, but it's all individually based. And hopefully we will, we have, it says here, we launched groups our past winter, this past winter, and we'll be launching those groups again. So who do we treat? And I think this is just a helpful picture of the different types of people that are coming into intensive treatment programs. So our program is largely OCD. Almost 70% of the patients that come in have a primary diagnosis of OCD. But that said, we get quite a bit of social anxiety disorder. So almost a fifth of our patients are coming in with social anxiety disorder as their primary diagnosis. Um, a, just under 10% are coming in for another anxiety disorder diagnosis that's not social anxiety disorder. And Finally, about 4% are coming in for some non-OCD and non-anxiety disorder as their primary diagnosis. And some of those slip in, but can still really benefit from intensive treatment of CBT with a focus on exposure. And so for those of you who can see the slide, you can just see that on the right side, I've listed the co-primary or secondary diagnoses. And this is just to illustrate that we certainly see a lot of comorbidity. Um, so about, I, can, I can't really see it because my, my video is covering the top of the slide, but um, I believe it's in the 40s, around 40 something percent of the kids are coming in with just either OCD or social anxiety or whatever their primary diagnosis is. But that means that um, close to 60% of them are coming in with some comorbidity. And that I think is what most people probably experience when they're treating OCD or anxiety, that people aren't just coming in with one diagnosis. They might be coming in with OCD plus an anxiety disorder, OCD plus depression, OCD plus ADHD, OCD plus a tick disorder. And so we see that quite often. So what do we actually do? So like I said, we offer three groups a week. Each of them is two hours. So if somebody decided they needed to do the full 10 hours a week of our intensive treatment program, they might come in Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday after school from 4 to 6 p.m. And then they might have another, an additional four individual and or family sessions to supplement that. So that rounds out to a full 10 hours a week. We try to keep our whole programming during after school hours, and that's because we really want to either treat people while they're in school and keep them in school, or if they're out of school because their symptoms are so incredibly impairing, our goal is to get them back into school like yesterday. So we, you know, people sometimes call me and they say, I'm going to pull my kid out to do your program, 
And my advice is almost always, with of course exceptions for individual cases, that we wanna get your kid back to functioning in their own environment. And when we take them out of that, we're risking having them be able to do it only in certain places, but not others. Or we take away their stressors, which can be advantageous if they really need a break from those things to recover, but can also be problematic if we're not allowing them to learn how to do these things when they are stressed and when they're facing the stressors of daily life. So like I said, exposure and response prevention is the primary thing that we do in our groups. But in a typical two-hour group, we'll spend the first half on a CBT skill, which could be psychoeducation, it could be cognitive restructuring, it could be relaxation or a mindfulness skill, and it could be problem solving and or relapse prevention. And then during the bulk of the treatment, we're doing exposure and response prevention. And I'll give you guys a sample group. So um, I'll describe this in quite a bit of detail, but for those of you who can see it, you can see what a slide looks like. So this is describing a typical group that we might have and I think really illustrates how you can treat a wide array of different symptoms of OCD all at the same time. And so from 4 to 4.15, and our two-hour group is from 4 to 6. So from 4 to 4.15, we're going to be going over their homework, their exposure homework, with a reward. So every kid who's in our program is expected to be doing their exposures both in session and outside. Treatment is, is only as good as you can translate it to your day-to-day -day life. So they come in and they describe what they've done for homework and we give them rewards for that. They then, oh, and I just wanna note that in a group setting, so some people come in that I don't wanna do a group setting, I only wanna do this one-on-one. -on -one. I find that there's an absolutely beautiful thing that happens in a group setting, that there's a type of positive peer pressure that goes on, that the kids encourage each other to do things in a way that often no therapist or parent really ever can. And they, are, they feel accountable to one another and they look around the room and they see everybody else doing their homework and engaging and they feel compelled to do the same thing. So I encourage every family that is appropriate for our group to at least give it a shot. And I find that more often than not, people actually really like the group and stick with it even when they're quite skeptical in the beginning. From 4.15 to about five o'clock, we'll do a skill. So in this particular group that I'm describing, we, do co we did cognitive restructuring. And so we'll try to do this in a fun group way. We might debate evidence for and against thoughts and set up where one person volunteers a thought and then we set up a courtroom and each, you know, the kids are split into two different sides. Each side, one has to um, prove evidence for the thought to prove that it is 100% true. The other side has to prove evidence against the thought, poking some holes in the thought, and then finally coming up with a more realistic version of that thought based on facts rather than emotional reasoning. We have lots of different cognitive exercises that we do. That's just one of them. And we'll rotate through them to keep it fresh and exciting. And then we get to the core part of the group, which is exposure and response prevention. So each kid is doing things all at the same time. Sometimes we have the opportunity to do a group exposure that includes everybody. We had a mock prom at one point, um, which you'd be amazed at how many different exposures you can fit into a prom setting. There's contamination things with food. There's social anxiety exposures with talking to people. There's all sorts of different things that can come up. And so that was one that we could plan in advance that could include exposures for everybody in the group all in one interaction. In this group in particular that I'm using as an example, we had six kids and each of these six kids was doing something different. So B was reaching out to friends from school. She was struggling with social anxiety and had a hard time responding to people. O was touching items in the bathroom without washing. So he had a focus on contamination. And um, so he would increase his level of contamination exposures by tr tr uh, touching harder and harder things in the bathroom. So the wall, then the soap dispenser, then the paper towels, then the toilet itself, and practiced refraining from washing his hands afterwards. E also was struggling with OCD, but she was practicing both um, social anxiety exposures as well as OCD. So in this particular group, for example, she was practicing saying no to peers requests. So we would have group members all ask her all sorts of questions and have her practice saying, nope, can't do that, won't do that, won't share my pencil, won't share my food. S was watching a movie that triggered his intrusive thoughts for OCD. And so, you know, practicing facing things that come in. A was typing without deleting and retyping things. And in our groups, we often have people bring in their actual school homework. We don't want to practice with just sample items. We want them to be practicing with the things that are most difficult for them. And R was practicing interoceptive exposures, meaning facing the physical sensations of panic 
And she also was practicing eating in front of peers to target some social anxiety fears. So these are just sample patients that really explain what different people can do. And we can have six different people practicing six different exposures all at the same time. And the common theme across all of them is that they're practicing facing fears and facing things that are challenging for them. And they all know that each other are doing that. And the encouragement is amazing that goes on in these groups. Finally, for the last 10, 15 minutes or so of group, we'll wrap up, review things, troubleshoot, and plan homework for the very next day. So we'll talk about what goes on here, what went on here today, and how can we get you to translate this to your home setting, and how can you practice it once you're there? So how did we do? So how does a program like this actually do? So um, we've treated over 100 patients in the past three years and change, which has been extremely exciting. And so, and the average OCD severity that comes in is about a 25 on the Cybox for the children's Yale Brown obsessive compulsive scale, um, which is in the severe range of OCD. So the patients that we're seeing in our program are quite severe. Um, and it's interesting when you think about different um, settings, whether it's a partial hospitalization or even residential, often the scores are around that range. So there's different reasons that bring people into different settings, which we'll talk about a little bit when I talk about expanding this into acute care units. Um, but these patients are able to do this on an outpatient setting, meaning they're safe enough and functioning enough to be able to do this at home. But I'll tell you that many of the patients that we see are having a lot of trouble navigating through their day-to-day -day lives which is usually why they're signing up for an intensive treatment program. The average length of stay is such a hard question to answer, and yet it's a question that every parent wants to know. So if there's any parents watching this webinar, um, that is something that I certainly wanted to address, but also for clinicians, when you're asked this question, it's a hard question to answer. And it's probably the same question that you're asked with regular outpatient treatment. How long is my, patient, is my kid going to have to see you for? And so the answer is we don't necessarily know, um, but, and there's also great variability in how people engage with our program. Like I said earlier, some people are coming in over a really short period of time. They only have two weeks to do this. And so they might be doing 10 hours a week for one or two weeks straight, and that's all they've got. And then they're going to go back to their outpatient provider who's local for them. And so for those patients, treatment is short and sweet and a lot of treatment all at once. Other people may opt to spread it out a little bit more, might do only three or four hours a week, but do it for a longer period of time. Some people, as soon as they're ready to step down to weekly outpatient, might leave our program, whereas other people stick with us for a longer period of time. And I think it's important to highlight all of this because intensive treatment programs don't necessarily need to take just one format. A lot of people can benefit from intensive treatment programs in different ways. And I love to talk about our program because I think it really highlights how you can implement this treatment quite flexibly and meet different needs of different patients all at the same time. So... All of that was to say our average length of, of stay is 34 hours of treatment, but that looks so different from each for each child and there's huge variability um, across family to family. Of the 72 patients that we had that we have seen with primary OCD, um, 57 of them have reportable outcomes and that's to account for uh, a bunch of them who switched to a different level of care, some of them to a higher level of care because they really needed that more acute care setting, and some of them to a lower level of care. And like we started out by talking about intensive treatment and regular outpatient weekly treatment, they have the same results. So if somebody opts for weekly outpatient treatment, that is no problem. And for some people that works a lot better for their lifestyle or what they're looking for. Um, we still have some patients ongoing, so we obviously don't have data from them just yet. So of the ones that have completed our program, they started out with a Cybox score of 25, which is in the severe range, and they ended at post-treatment with an average Cybox or Ybox score of 13, which is in the mild range of OCD. And um, that's a 12-point reduction, which is about 46, 47%, and that puts us right in the responder or remission status. And 81% of our patients are hitting responder or remission status. So we're really, really excited about that, and I think it's just one more treatment settings showing that intensive treatment yields really, really great results. The responses from patients are also incredibly rewarding. So for families out there struggling with OCD, I can tell you that families are coming back to our program saying, I can't believe how quickly I got better. It's kind of freaky. Uh, we've had patients go off to college and say, I would have been repeating my senior year of high school had I not done this program. And so we're just really excited about the idea that we can get people back on track and back on track quickly. So 
now I've talked a lot about intensive treatment in an outpatient setting. But what about intensive treatment in acute care units? So there are fewer studies on partial hospitalization programs and, in, and inpatient programs in terms of what they look like for evidence-based care. It's harder to study, it's harder to have a randomized controlled trial um, for some of these treatments. Our goal at Cornell, and I encourage many people to be thinking about it in a similar way, is to really hit the needs of every patient at every level of care. So we already have weekly outpatient treatment. We already have an intensive outpatient program. In September, we rolled out an OCD track within our partial hospitalization program that's already been around for a while. And we're in the process of rolling out in, uh, an OCD track on our inpatient unit up on our Westchester campus. And so we're really hoping that we can hit every kid and family at any level of need that they are looking for and to make sure that anybody gets treatment and gets treatment quickly to address their needs. So many people think about OCD as an outpatient problem. Um, they think about it as something that can just be treated with once a week treatment. However, if you are a family suffering from OCD, you might realize that this is not always manageable in just once a week treatment. And if you're a provider, you might have seen many, many patients who have come through your doors who really need a higher level of care. So if we think about what brings someone to an acute care unit and what might make them benefit from that type of treatment, some patients have harm-related concerns. So intrusive thoughts is a lesser talked about, but very common symptom of OCD, where people have thoughts that they are afraid of because they are the opposite of what they want. And they are afraid that their thought, the fact that they're having a thought about something, which might be a pretty normal thought to pass by our minds, they give it more credit and those thoughts are stickier. And therefore, they get more and more afraid. The more they try to get rid of these thoughts, the more that they come in. They might have thoughts or images about harming themselves or harming others. And this is something that absolutely can bring someone to an emergency room, especially if they're not able to recognize that it's part of their OCD and they're concerned that they may be a danger to themselves or others. Not eating. So a patient who has severe contamination concerns to the point where they're not able to eat or drink, that might be a person who needs an acute care stay. Similarly, OCD symptoms can interfere in a number of ways in school or home performance. So patients can be unable to walk fluidly without compulsions. Eating, we talked about. They might not be able to write. They might not be able to bathe, feed themselves. And so these patients might need an acute care stay as well. They might just not be functioning because of the level of their symptoms. And finally, comorbidity is a huge thing that brings people into inpatient units or into partial hospitalization programs. So as we talked about before, OCD doesn't exist in a vacuum. Many patients with OCD are suffering from other conditions as well. And those conditions might be what brings someone into an inpatient unit. And while we certainly might wanna address those conditions first, we wanna be cognizant of that this patient has OCD and we wanna make sure that we're giving them appropriate care or at the very least education about what they're going through and what's going on and setting them up with the right level of care upon discharge. So in terms of when a patient comes into an acute care unit, we wanna think about assessing and deciding what to treat. So just going backwards one, so when we think about what acute care presentations look like, I mentioned either highly interfering OCD symptoms themselves, like those intrusive thoughts that might have harm related concerns, like severe compulsions or obsessions, or the, on the other hand, comorbid or co-occurring conditions like disruptive behavior disorders, major depressive disorders, emotion regulation concerns, autism spectrum disorder. Those are things that can be coming on. And we wanna think about what do we do in an acute care unit and how do we take care of this patient to make sure that they're getting all of their needs met, but that we're also prioritizing the things that we need to prioritize. So first of all, we want to assess, assess, assess. So the first step to good care is good assessment. We wanna make sure that we truly understand what is going on for this patient, both within their OCD symptoms and also thinking about what other things are going on. We wanna prioritize. And in this, we're thinking about what do we wanna treat first, especially when you have a short length of stay with a patient on an acute care unit. So when I think about what we wanna treat and whether or not this patient is ready to treat, to have their OCD be addressed, I think about, is there another condition going on that's interfering with their ability to engage in OCD treatment? So two patients, both have depression and OCD. One patient might be totally ready to engage in treatment and the other may not be. And so a distinguishing factor is how much those depression symptoms are interfering with the ability to engage in treatment. So for patient one, we might see that their depression symptoms 
are causing anhedonia. They're pulling away from all the activities that they used to enjoy. They're really lethargic. All the motivation is gone. That patient might really need some of those depression symptoms to lift before they're ready to engage in an extremely demanding treatment of exposure and response prevention for OCD. Whereas another patient, even with equally severe depression symptoms, might be presenting with some suicidal ideation, low mood, but if you probe them about it, they might disclose to you, hey, my life is completely destroyed by my OCD symptoms. I am considering harming myself because of how distressed, impaired, frustrated I am by all the symptoms that are going on in my life. And for that patient, even though their depression may technically be as severe, they might be ready to go in terms of OCD treatment. And in fact, treating their OCD may help alleviate some of their symptoms of depression. If they are ready to engage in OCD treatment, and even if they aren't, we want to provide psychoeducation. So we want to provide as much education as possible about OCD treatment, both to prepare them for the exposures that we might be starting that very day, and or to prepare them for exposures they might be doing down the road once they have conquered some of the symptoms of the other interfering conditions. And finally, refer to the correct treatment. If that's OCD care, amazing. That's what most of the people probably watching this webinar love to do. But if it's treating something else first, that's fine too. And we just wanna make sure we're setting them up for success, both in that treatment for something else and then down the line for their OCD treatment. through this, these slides seem to have duplicated. So I just wanna talk about some of the barriers to implementation. So I've been singing the praises of intensive treatment and that's because it's something that I absolutely love and I've seen the patient benefits. However, there are certain barriers to implementing these types of programs. So one of them is cost, like I talked about. And if it's a private facility, it may be very costly to access intensive care, especially if your insurance doesn't provide out of network benefit, out of network reimbursement or the ability to do that. Insurance companies, like I said, haven't caught up to all the things that we're doing and may not cover an intensive treatment model as part of their usual care um, in terms of your behavioral health benefits. Availability. So these programs are unfortunately relatively few and far between, and that's improving, but it's still a concern. Expertise. So I think a lot of people, and I'm actually going to combine this with clinician fear because sometimes it's one, sometimes the other, sometimes it's a little bit of both. I think that, you know, this this whole webinar is really trying to reach out to people who are interested in OCD care, yet there's lots and lots of people who don't know how to do OCD treatment well or might know how to do it well, but it feels scary and overwhelming to them. And then the idea of adding on an intensive level of care feels even scarier and even more overwhelming. So I certainly don't wanna diminish the need for good training and a good skill set within OCD treatment. But if you are already equipped with that, or if your provider is equipped with that, then they certainly may be able to intensify your care. So even if there is no kind of existing program in your area, you, there may be a way to access intensive treatment, even just by asking your clinician to see you more frequently. So if they're already doing OCD treatment, doing it more may be of benefit to you. And so this is, was an article that was in the New York Times in August 2018, yes, um, which we were fortunate enough to be featured in, but it really covered all of the different treatment programs for intensive, all, a lot of different intensive treatment programs for a number of different disorders. And the idea of it, I think the reason I bring it up here is that it really highlights that intensive treatment is a way of the future, hopefully of the present as well. But I think more and more people are interested in this, treat, in this type of treatment. And this article really highlights that it's not just good for OCD, it's good for PTSD, it's good for other anxiety disorders. And I think that we've been rooted for a very long time in the model of therapy as you see your therapist once a week for that 45 or 50 minute session, you go home and then you come back in one week. And that can change. And I think thinking outside the box and thinking about the different ways that we can do things is absolutely a direction that we all might wanna think about going in and meeting the needs of each patient and each family and different populations that we may see. So what's next? Where do we go from here? So I think there's an absolute need for more trainings about intensive treatment for OCD to hit some of that need for clinicians to feel more confident and ready to do intensive treatment for OCD. We might need some manuals and guidebooks and that's something that we're thinking about and working on because 
even though you can do this in a number of different ways, it would be helpful for people to have some guidelines for how to implement a program and how to do that in a large number of settings. On that same token, we wanna to focus on flexible implementation, that each setting might have different needs, different populations that they're serving. So what might work in a clinic setting might be very different from what might work in a research setting and in different areas across the country. We need more research. So while there's that exploding number of research studies on intensive treatment for OCD, we still don't have all the answers about when and for whom we should recommend intensive treatment. Who's gonna benefit from it the most? When are you done? When is intensive treatment enough? And when you can switch to the next level of care? And finally, more programs. So call to action to all of you sitting out there who are thinking about this. I really encourage you to think about implementing these programs. They're rewarding and fun and uh, help a lot of people. So a special thank you to everybody who has helped me build up these programs that we're doing. And then of course, to Elliot Kamenetsky and everybody here for hosting us. So any questions from either, I don't know if we can accept questions from the live stuff, but here first. All right, yes. So I certainly didn't do those studies. I can send you the references, um, but there's, a, there's about four or five studies that summarize and they're done differently. So some are fMRI, some are PET scans. So they're done a little bit differently um, and measure neurobiological changes, but I'm happy to talk about those with you later. Yes. Um, can you speak a little bit about uh, the implementation of um, trauma-related uh, OCD therapy in when you're also working with kids who are It's a great question because it's such an important differential and it, like you bring up, it happens, both of them can occur at the same time. Sure. So the question was, what do you do um, in terms of how do you treat harm-related concerns for, for intrusive thoughts while treating kids who may have true suicidal ideation at the same time or do have true suicidal ideation at the same time? So first of all, we really need to think about that differential. Which is it or is it both? And I think the best way to assess for that is to provide really solid, clear education about what intrusive thoughts are what they, and what they aren't. Um, and then talk to your patients about, so some people are distressed by their thoughts about suicide and death because they are the opposite of what they wanna do. It's like, why the heck is this thought coming into my mind? It's intruding upon me. I do not want it here. Um, and I'm trying to get rid of it. And that's why it's distressing for me. Other kids are distressed about their thoughts about suicide because they're very distressing. And it's like, I can't believe my life is at this point where I'm considering this and thinking about this. I'm so distressed and depressed. And that may be a separate thing. And some people have both. So I'll really try to give a lot of education to my patients, give them some very concrete examples about intrusive thoughts and how they grow. And then say, does that sound like you? Which of these two things is it or is it both? And often patients, you know, as long as they can comprehend that education that they're giving you are really able to articulate which they're experiencing. If it is the case that it's both, we certainly want to always have safety first. So even from kind of a DBT framework, we want to think about tier one life interfering behaviors. To put it bluntly, if you're not here, we can't do treatment. So we have to make sure that you're safe and alive before we can do anything else. So if there's true safety concerns, we always wanna address that first. And there are families who will be like, but I really wanna talk about this other stuff. And it's like, okay, hang on. We wanna just make sure you're safe and then we can get to everything else. So you certainly wanna address those safety concerns first and foremost. But then you can certainly do exposures to those intrusive thoughts, especially if they're slightly different. Um, either once you're, you're confident that those safety concerns are under control, or if there's something separate, doing that in a different way. We might start slow, by introducing people to the idea that, hey, um, my thoughts don't necessarily mean anything about me. I can think a thought and it doesn't necessarily change my desires. Sometimes I'll have kids do an exercise where I'll have them identify what their favorite food is. And then I'll say, okay, for the next 24 hours, all I want you to think about is how much you hate that food. You love sushi? How do you, uh, think about how much you hate sushi. And then tomorrow night, I want you to have sushi for dinner. Let's see if thinking about hating sushi changed any of your desires. So that's a way to just explain some of these concepts in a fairly benign way that's getting at some of these concerns that my thoughts mean something about me 
without getting at it in a dangerous way. That's not to say we want to shy away from the actual symptoms because we certainly don't want to teach our patients that their thoughts are dangerous. In fact, quite the contrary. But I think the answer that I'm trying to get at is it's possible to do both at the same time, but we always certainly want to address safety concerns first. Any other questions? Oh, I don't know. Let me see if I can exit out of these slides first. Um, if I do stop share. I don't see anything on this, so I don't know if that's where it would pop up. All right, no questions. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. All right, it must be very clear. Okay, All well, right. thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'm gonna slide away and let you do that. <laughs>